Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for our webinar titled Super Argus PET CT, Advanced Preclinical Imaging for Small to Medium Animals. This is Liam Sanyo, and I'm very pleased to be your host for today's event. Our session today is sponsored by Syntica Instrumentation, and will feature Tanya Coulthard, who manages Syntica's imaging division. Tanya will provide some background on preclinical PET CT imaging and give an overview of how it works. She will also introduce the Setical Super Argus PET CT system and discuss applications of PET CT in oncology, neuroscience, and cardiovascular research. All right, well, without any further ado, I'll pass things over to Tanya. Tanya, take it away whenever you're ready. Thanks, Liam, and welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining me today as we introduce the Super Argus systems from Setical. We here at Syntica Instrumentation distribute the Setical systems, and we would be happy to talk more about your research following this webinar. During today's webinar, I will spend a few slides reviewing PET as a preclinical imaging modality. I will then move to introducing you to the Super Argus systems spending a bit of time reviewing the wide variety of research applications where PET-CT can be used. And finally, I will finish up with a review of what makes Setical Systems unique. I'll take a few slides to review the principles of positron emission tomography as an imaging modality. I will then briefly review the main applications where PET is used preclinically. My review of PET as an imaging modality will be brief. For those of you familiar with the imaging modality, please bear with me while I hope to educate those who are less familiar with the modality on some of the basics so that they may understand better some of the important features of the Super Argus system as we move through this presentation. PET imaging is used routinely clinically to diagnose and monitor progression of numerous diseases, including a wide variety of cancers. PET imaging requires the injection of a radioactive material into the patient. This material is often called a radioisotope or tracer. The agent has been specifically designed to target the disease or tissue of interest. In the case of tumor detection, a radioactive isotope of glucose is used, called FDG, or fluorodeoxyglucose, and it has an F18 radioactive atom included in its structure. This radioactive tracer accumulates in areas where there is high metabolic activity, including tumors. As F18 and other radioisotopes decay, they emit a positron, when, sorry, which then travels a short distance and collides with an electron in the surrounding tissue. This interaction causes an annihilation event, resulting in the re release of two gamma photons in approximately opposing directions. These gamma photons travel until they encounter the gamma ray detectors. These detectors will send a signal to the electronics when they detect a gamma photon with a specific energy related to the isotope. The electronics are programmed to determine which gamma rays were detected in coincidence, that is, those which were sensed by opposing gamma ray detectors at the same time. It can then be presumed that these gamma photons were the result of an annihilation event caused by the release of a positron as the radioisotope decayed. The electronics then form a line of response, or an LOR, between the coincidence gamma rays and use this information from all of the detected coincidence events to reconstruct an image. Many coincidence events and lines of response are required to accurately reconstruct an image, providing spatial information about the location of the radioisotope within space, as well as quantifiable measures of the concentration based on the counts. Let's take a closer look at the process of acquiring a PET image. There are a variety of isotopes which are commonly used in PET imaging. That is because they emit a positron during their decay, which sets off an annihilation event and results in gamma rays that we spoke about on the previous slide. Important to note, however, is the half-life of these isotopes. When short, when short, the radioactivity will decay very quickly and the tracers will not be useful for long after it is made. So one must be very close to the source. Typically, radioisotopes used in PET imaging are manufactured in a cyclotron. The same cyclotron is used to manufacture radioisotopes for clinical and preclinical imaging applications, as there is really no difference between them. Chemists at these facilities may be able to make custom radioisotopes or radio, tracer, radio tracers as desired by the specific research application. These may include small molecules, 
antibodies, and other com compounds which may be of interest to the res researchers across a wide variety of applications, as we will discuss shortly. Once the radio tracer is made in the cyclotron, and again, this must be a positron emitting isotope, the radio tracer is injected into the animal model to be used for imaging. We will discuss some specific examples, but as an easy example would be to inject FTG, the radioactive isotope of glucose for detecting the tumor. This may be injected into an animal suspected of having a tumor or perhaps a metastatic tumor model where it is not known where these tumors may be forming. In the case of the animal, in this case, the animal is placed into the PET scanner and an image acquired. A PET image alone will only show where the signal is present and it will be located within three-dimensional space. However, without an anatomical reference, there is no way to know where the PET signal originates from. This is where a quick anatomical CT scan following the PET acquisition can help to provide some context for the PET signal. These images are co-registered and can provide, provide the researcher with a tremendous amount of information about a specific target of interest. Let's look quickly at a few of the main applications where PET is used. Traditionally, preclinical imaging researchers from oncology, neurology, cardiology, and others have found benefit in using PET to better understand a variety of molecular targets or to study the disease state and progression. Additionally, PET has been used to study biodistribution of specific targets and therapeutic compounds, and, a dynamic, imaging, and dynamic imaging is starting to become popular to study more of the kinetics of tracer migration throughout the imaging subject. I'd now like to shift the focus a bit from PET as an imaging modality to CETACOL and the Super Argus systems specifically. I will briefly introduce you to CETACOL. As many of you are not familiar with the company name, although many are familiar with their systems already without knowing it. I will then discuss the various Super Argus models as well as CETACOL's compact models. I will finish up this section by reviewing the multi-animal imaging capabilities of the Super Argus systems. So let's start back. So first off, who is CETACOL? CETACOL's head office is located in Madrid, Spain. It was founded in 2002. They do have facilities in six other countries around the world. For nearly 20 years, CETACOL has been manufacturing equipment for most of the clinical equipment suppliers as an original equipment manufacturer, or OEM. Additionally, CETACOL has been manufacturing pre preclinical PET systems that were sold by GE as their Explore Vista system, as well as for Bioscan as their BioPET CT system. There are approximately 100 of these branded systems installed worldwide. At Cetical's head office in Madrid, Spain, they manufacture their unique FOSWITCH detectors. FOSWITCH is the combination of, of phosphor and sandwich. Phosphors are organic and inorganic materials which emit photons as the result of an interaction with an incoming particle such as a gamma ray from a radioisotope. These photons emitted from the phosphors can be detected by phot photon multiplier tubes and result in an electrical signal which within the imaging system. In a phoswitch detector, two different phosphor materials are used to make up the detector, hence the sandwich. We will see more about this later. These detectors are key to the unique features of the Super Argus and Compact systems. The same detectors are used in both systems and provide true depth of interaction, or, t or TDOI, which we will talk about in more detail towards the end of the presentation. These detectors are also highly sensitive, again, adding to the unique features of the Super Argus systems. CETACOL provides global service and support, and with Syntica instrumentation located in southwestern Ontario and Canada, there is an opportunity for even closer service and support options. As CETACOL manufactures their preclinical systems to meet or exceed all international and safety standards. Let's now take some time to review the Super Argus and Compact models available from CETACOL. These system are, systems are state-of-the-art and have been designed and manufactured for the use in small preclinical imaging spaces and within existing lab spaces. The systems are self-shielded to meet FDA guidelines. This means that there are no special room preparations needed for the systems, and the operator and others can remain in the room during image acquisition. With this in mind, the systems can be easily placed within existing lab spaces, imaging cores, and other animal facilities. 
All of the systems come with an integrated animal handling system, which can include anesthesia and gas scavenging, heating, and physiological monitoring. Images from these systems can be saved in a variety of formats, including DICOM, Interfile, or JPEG. This means that they can be taken to any number of third-party software options for analysis. We can provide you with a license for the VivoQuant software to complete your analysis if desired. Setacall offers both PET or CT compact models. These systems are ideally suited for mouse imaging, having a bore diameter of 55 millimeters. Acquisition times are short, with a 15-second acquisition for an anatomical CT image. The PET system has four rings, including 32 of Setacall's FOSSWITCH detectors. 3D reconstructions of the PET image take less than two minutes to perform, giving a resolution around one millimeter, similar to that of the larger Super Argus systems. Moving now to the Super Argus system, you have the choice between PET alone or PET with CT, and of course CT alone if you choose. There are three different options for bore sizes. The little r is ideally suited for mice, rats, and other small animals such as marmosets, having a 90 millimeter bore diameter. The big r has a larger bore at 160 millimeter diameter and is ideally suited for larger animals up to rabbits around six kilograms. Also, with the big r system, multi-animal imaging is possible as I will show you later on. The P model has been designed for even larger animals such as non-human primates, canines, and pigs. The bore of the system is 260 millimeters. From there, each pet system has a choice of how many pet rings to include. Two rings will cover 50 millimeters in a fixed axial field of view, four rings will cover 100 millimeters, and six rings will cover 150 millimeters. In all systems, there's a dynamic axial field of view which will extend the area covered during imaging as selected by the researcher. The CT component of the Super Argus system is designed for long longitudinal studies focusing on low dose radiation while providing high resolution and rapid scan times. The Super Argus system is considered best in class for many reasons. They are listed here, but I will highlight a few. The resolution of the PET images is right around one millimeter. This is comparable to many other systems on the market. What makes the Super Argus system unique is the resolution uniformity across the entire field of view. And that is, this field of view covers the majority of the bore size. I will show you some images that will help explain this a bit later on. The systems are very sensitive and this adds to the ability to do dynamic imaging as well as real-time imaging. More on this later. Setical has focused a lot of attention on their reconstruction algorithms and tried to optimize the algorithms and, systems and system design to allow for rapid reconstruction of the PET image. A full 3D OSEM or ordered subset expectation maximization reconstruction takes under two minutes. In the OSEM algorithm, the system takes an iterative approach to reconstruction as opposed to an arithmetic or analytical approach as is done in the FBV or filtered back projection algorithm. However, the FP, FBP algorithm can reconstruct images in less than five seconds. And so this algorithm is used in real time on the system so that you can get live feedback on the pet imaging during the acquisition so you can confirm that your pet agent is visual, visualized within the air, imaging area or that your IV injection was successful, for example. When comparing image quality of systems, it is always best to look at an F18 bone scan. In this scan, sodium fluoride is injected and is taken up into the bones to provide the signal you see here. These images here are PET images, not CT images. The resolution and performance of the system, including the different reconstructions, can be clearly seen in these images. Many, many manufacturers, including us, will talk about a lot of different technical specifications and how these numbers compare to each other. However, ultimately, for most researchers, image quality is the most important, and I encourage you to request bone, scans, bone scan images as part of your comparison between the systems. When describing the different models earlier, I spoke about multi-animal imaging capabilities. So let's take a look at this now. Setical is able to design a variety of multi-animal imaging systems to meet specific needs. However, most commonly, researchers want to image as many animals as possible to either improve throughput or to work within the half-life of the radioisotope that they have made at the cyclotron. 
think back to the half-lives of the different radioisotopes that have been discussed earlier. If the half-life is short, like C11, then being able to image four mice simultaneously is going to allow you to use more of your radio tracer faster for imaging than doing four mice sequentially over time. This four mouse animal handling system fits within the big R model having a 160 millimeter bore. Each animal chamber has individual controls for anesthesia and heating. A separate workstation can be added onto the system to allow for offline preparation of the animals while another set of animals is being imaged. Here are some examples using the multi-animal handling system. Here, four mice were imaged simultaneously. You can see the resolution and sensitivity are maintained throughout the entire field of view. This is, as I mentioned earlier, due to the state-of-the-art FOSS switch detectors manufactured in Spain. We will take a bit, talk a bit more about the true depth of field and corrections for the parallax errors in a few slides from now. For now, I hope you simply can appreciate the consistent image resolution and sensitivity in all of these animals. Here's another example of the multi-animal bed. Here, three mice were positioned right next to each other for imaging. Each mouse was injected with a low dose of antibody bound to zirconium-89, yet another radioisotope which can be used in pet imaging. These pet images took five minutes to acquire. With the high sensitivity of the Super Argus system, this means that low doses or small volumes of tracers can be given to the animals, preserving the tracer if it is difficult or expensive to manufacture. Moving on from the features of the system to some more images focused on specific application areas. <clears throat> we will start with some images from oncology. Oncology is an area where PET is used routinely to look at things such as cell proliferation, angiogenesis, receptor ligand interactions, metabolism, etc. As the radioisotopes are injected into the animal, PET can be used on any type of tumor model from xenografts to transgenic models and is also ideally suited to look, at, look for metastases. Of all the system's capabilities, the most important for oncology work are the high sensitivity, spatial resolution, and the ability for the images to be quantified. In this example, a large tumor can be seen on the hind limb of this rat. The animal was injected with FTG, which is, as I mentioned previously, is a, simply a radioactive version of glucose. So here we are able to image the metabolic activity within the tumor, as well as other structures in the rat, such as the myocardium and brain. When looking closely at the tumor, you can clearly see the areas of higher and lower metabolic activity based on the color scale within the image. These images are fully quantifiable and various regions of interest could be drawn. Here the CT image also provides us with some anatomical context for where the PET signal is located within the body of the animal. The heterogeneity within a tumor's metabolic activity is clearly seen in the subcutaneous tumor derived from pancreatic tumor cells. Here again, FTG was injected and the necrotic core within the tumor is clearly visible. On most of the images, you will see that I have added information about the animal model, injected dose, and agent used, along with image acquisition information. For those of you familiar with PET, you will quickly appreciate this information and be able to understand better the performance of the Super Argus systems. In this example, the mouse had two tumors. One was positive for PSMA, or prostate-specific membrane antigen, and the other was negative for this antigen. In this experiment, DCFBC was injected to the mouse. DCFBC is a PET ant agent specifically designed to target pro prostate-specific membrane antigen. For this reason, we are clearly able to visualize the tumor on the animal's left shoulder, but not on the animal's right. This agent also has some affinity for the liver, kidney, and bladder. In the graph, we can see that as the levels of an agent decline over time in the blood and kidneys, the levels remain elevated in both the PSMA positive tumor on the left shoulder and also to some extent in the liver. Moving now to some neuro neurological applications of PET. PET is also routinely used in neurological research, both clinically and preclinically. PET tracers have been developed to look at biodistribution of specific targets, cerebral flow and metabolism, dopamine transmission, receptor binding site, local, sorry, receptor binding site localization, and many others. These tracers have been used to study diseases such as Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, 
stroke, epilepsy, traumatic brain injury, and a wide variety of neuropsychiatric disorders. In these studies, the high sensitivity along with the high temporal and spatial resolution of the superargus systems are key. This is a quick example of cerebral metabolism. Here, FDG, again, that glucose tracer, was injected into the rat and metabolic activity within the various regions of the brain can be clearly visualized with high spatial resolution. In this example, a C11 tracer was used to study dopamine receptor activity in mice. MPTP, or 1-methyl-4-phenyl-1,2,3-tetrahydropyridine, was given and is known to markedly reduce dopaadrenergic dopa activity in the striatum. Dynamic PET imaging was used to create a time versus intensity curve for the C11 tracer in a control and MPTP injected animal. From these graphs, the binding potential of the tracer can be determined. The graphs also highlight the ability to differentiate between the various regions of the brain. Here, the striatum and the cerebellum are seen due to the high resolution of these images. This study from a group in Zurich, Switzerland, made the cover of the Journal of Neurochemistry back in 2015. This group worked to develop a tracer to study the meta metabotropic glutamate receptor 5, or mglu R5 which utilizes the F18 isotope rather than a C11 isotope on an analogous target from which they had previously been used. The importance of this is that the half-life of F18 is much longer than that of C11, making this tracer more widely available and lengthening its usable life once manufactured in a cyclotron. This tracer is important in studying the synaptic plasticity and modulation of neural network activity, which is relevant in a number of psychiatric and neurological disorders. With the development of an F18 tracer option, the logistics of conducting these studies becomes much simpler. This study, looking at the brain function in developing chick embryos, made the cover of Current Biology back in 2012. In this study, eggs were removed from the incubator and small holes were made in the shell. A small amount of the PET tracer was inserted through this hole onto the breathing membrane the tracer could then be absorbed into the bloodstream. The egg was then placed in a soundproof chamber, which can record the heartbeats and movements of the embryo due to the vibrations of the eggshell. Sounds were then played to try to awaken the embryo. This continued for 20 minutes while the PET tracer was taken up into the active areas of the brain. The eggs were then placed into the PET scanner and images were acquired. This group found that when the sounds were introduced to young embryos, the metabolic activity was only found in the ventral brainstem, including the cerebellum and the spinal cord. However, when the older embryos were exposed to the sound, the metabolic activity was found throughout the entire brain, including the forebrain. This awakening of the brain is crucial to the embryo being able to process sensory inputs from their environment. This group also found that it was important that the sound played mimicked maternal vocalizations and not just random sounds. Another common use of PET imaging is in cardiology. In cardiology, PET tracers have been developed to look at myocardial perfusion, metab metabolism, and viability of the myocardial wall, along with calcium scoring and coronary artery, artery disease and inflammation in plaque models. As mentioned, PET can be used in a wide variety of cardiac models preclinically, most of which are developed to study coronary artery disease, myocardial infarction, and heart failure. In addition to those key characteristics of the super Argus system, gating capabilities become important for cardiac imaging. In this example, the rats were injected with FDG to look at the metabolic activity of the myocardium. The heart muscle, as we know, works hard and continuously to keep the animal alive. In these images, we can see the wall of the left and right ventricle. The difference in metabolic activity of these walls is clearly seen. The high resolution of these systems even allows the visualization of the small structures in the left ventricle called the papillary muscles. These are important in landmarking within the heart, but also function to allow the mitral valve to open and close properly. These images taken on a mouse heart moving from the base through to the apex through a series of images. 
Here we can see the importance of the gating capabilities to allow us to capture all stages of the cardiac cycle over the various slices throughout the heart. A newer approach has been developed on the Super, super Argus system, one that does not require the, an ECG signal to perform the gating. Here you can see an example on a rat where the gating technique is compared to the automatic gating without an ECG signal. The results are quite remarkable. This technique makes cardiac imaging much simpler to set up and can also be used for, with the multi-animal handling system. We've focused on three big application areas for pets, including oncology, neurology, and cardiology. Let's spend a bit more time looking at a few other examples. In drug development, PET can be used to look at target concentrations, biodistribution, as well as kinetics. Dynamic 4D imaging, that is 3D imaging acquired over time, can be used to generate time activity curves to look at accumulation of radio tracers and biodistribution kinetics. A number of other diseases can be looked at with PET. These include metabolic bone disorders, rheumatoid arthritis, and metabolic disorders. Here, Sodium fluoride radio tracer is injected into the rat and is taken up into the bones over time. These types of images can be used to study bone cancer, metabolic disease, and even rheumatoid arthritis. The comparison here of the x-ray and PET images shows how high resolution the PET images are and even allowing the medullary cavity of both the femur and the tibia bones to be visualized. In inflammation studies, FDG can be used to look at the metabolic activity active areas and can be seen here in this rat model of arthritis. This level of metabolic activity is not seen in the control animal. Let's now shift mode slightly and finish up by talking about what makes the Cetacol system unique amongst other systems on the market today. We will briefly talk about some of their first to market achievements, but we'll focus more time on the truly unique features which provide a true benefit to your research. As I mentioned earlier, Cetacol has for many years been manufacturing preclinical PET systems that were branded and sold under GE and Bioscan. This is where many of these first-to-market achievements occurred. Cetacol was first to combine the PET and CT for small animal imaging, overcoming many of the problems encountered when decreasing the bore size of traditional systems. One of the main obstacles to overcome when decreasing the bore size was the parallax error. I will explain this in a slide or two. This was overcome by development of their FOS switch detectors, which provide true depth of interaction inf information. Again, I will talk about this more in just a couple of slides. Reconstruction of the PET images used to take a very long time. Improvements in computer technology were key to speeding this up, but so was development of novel reconstruction algorithms to help improve the results and decrease the time to generate an image. The Super Argus systems are currently the only systems on the market which do real-time PET imaging having frame rates as low as 25 milliseconds. This, as you will see a bit later, leads to the capability of doing awake brain imaging, an area of PET imaging which has never really been explored. I've talked a bit about the depth of interaction and parallax errors and their correction as we've gone through this presentation. I wanna take a few minutes to explain this to those who are less familiar with PET, but then also show the importance of consider considering this when looking at image quality between systems. Let's start with the parallax error. Remember from the start of the presentation that as a radioisotope, which has been injected into the animal began to decay, there is a release of a positron, which encounters an electron in the nearby tissue. This causes an, an annihilation event, releasing two gamma photons, which travel in nearly opposite directions until they encounter a detector. Once the gamma rays encounter the detector, a signal is generated within the system and is recorded as a coincidence. The system then presumes a line of response between the detectors who, where the gamma rays were detected. This is where we need to look a little bit deeper to understand the parallax error. Detectors have a specific height to them, and the gamma rays may interact with the detector at any point along this height. This is considered the depth of interaction. However, in a single layer detector, as you see here, the system can only assume that the gamma ray interacts with the detector at the very front, as they have no other way of knowing where along the height the gamma ray actually hits. As you can see here, the assumed line of response, based on the presumed depth of inter 
depth of interaction is quite far off from where the true line of interaction or line of response was. If the detectors could know exactly where the gamma ray hit along their height, then they would know the true line of response. This is parallax error. So keeping in mind what we just learned about the parallax error, let's take a look at what happens when you move around the field of view. When the annihilation event occurs in the center of the field of view, the parallax error is not very bad. If the annihilation event and resulting gamma rays do not happen right in the middle of the field of view and hit detectors that are close to perpendicular to themselves and instead are outside the center of the field of view or hit detectors at an angle, then the parallax error is increased as we see here by the wide, wider shadowed lines. This is all the result of the depth of interaction issue that we talked about on the previous slide. Here's another image to review the effects of the parallax error again. If the detectors are of a single material, then the depth of interaction issue will occur and will become more of an issue as we move outside the center of field of view. Here you can see that when the gamma rays originate in the middle of the field of view with a radial offset of zero, the resolution is quite good. However, when we move out of the center, increasing the radial offset, then the parallax error increases, and thus the resolution as we move out from the center will begin to drop off. We can see this in more detail in this graph. As the radial offset increases along the x-axis, we see that the radial spatial resolution gets worse along the y-axis and this effect increases the further from the center of the field of view you go. The overall effect of the parallax error that we are discussing here is that the error will increase as the bore diameter decreases, as is required for preclinical imaging systems optimized for use on small animals. The issue is conventionally overcome in two ways. That is to reduce the crystal height so there is not so much error in the depth of interaction of the gamma rays with the detectors, or increase the bore diameter to reduce the angle of the crystals with respect to the annihilation event. However, both of these dramatically reduce the sensitivity of the system. So how does the true depth of interaction phosphorus detectors from CETACOL overcome these challenges? Let's first look at the phosphorus design. The CETACOL detectors are made of two different phosphor materials, which are sandwiched on top of one another, as you see here. These materials were specifically selected because they're different reactions when hit with a gamma ray. This allows the detectors to provide additional information about where along the overall height the gamma rays were encountered, providing true depth of interaction information. This additional information can provide additional lines of response from the positron emitting source. These combined allow for correction of the parallax error, which ultimately improves the resolution as you move out from the center of field of view. When the phosphorus detectors are used, we can see the radial resolution when the annihilation event occurs at the center of the field of view. This is very, very similar to that which occurs as the annihilation event moves out from the center of the field of view. By overcoming the parallax error and improving resolution across the entire field of view, this allows more of the bore size to be used for effective imaging. The phosphorus design of the Super Argus virtually eliminates the parallax error by allowing true depth of interaction information. The overall height of the crystals is also increased, having a total height of 15 millimeters. Also important is the ability of the phosphorus detectors to provide four lines of response as the gamma rays may interact with either the top or bottom portion of either crystal. And finally, CETACOL's 3D OSEM reconstruction algorithms all add to their image quality. All of these features combined result in the improved and consistent resolution across the entire field of view, which fills most of the bore diameter of these systems. Additionally, the system maintains a very high sensitivity to a wide array of PET tracers. Okay, so what does all of this mean about parallax error correction, phosphorus detectors, true depth of field, and lines of response? What does this all really mean for your imaging? Here, a phantom was created with various sized radioactive rods in a specific sectors surrounded by an active ring. In this study, the phantom was inserted into the system with an offset of 1.2 centimeters from the center of field of view. Between images, the phantom was rotated 60 degrees 
from A through C. When no depth of interaction correction is applied, the effects are clear. There is a striking there is a streaking of the rods in most sectors, specifically for those that are further from the center of field of view. Additionally, smallest rods cannot be resolved and the ring of activity on the outside cannot be seen in its entirety on the outer portion of the field of view. However, when the depth of interaction information is taken into account, there is no streaking seen and the entire outer ring can be seen in all positions. The smallest rods are clearly, visible, clearly resolved in all images, even when they are the furthest from the center of field of view. When combining the depth of interaction correction, along with the reconstruction algorithms developed by Setacol, a consistent resolution can be maintained across the entire field of view. This is not seen when using other reconstruction algorithms or when the depth of interaction information is not included. This study shows that the highest possible resolution for the Super Argus system right under one, it sits right under one millimeter, and this is maintained across the entire field of view. From the previous discussion, we talked about how having smaller bore size and longer detectors increases the sensitivity of the Super Argus system. This will become increasingly important as we move to looking at real-time imaging. Here we can see a rat situated in the Super Argus system with a tail vane in place. As the operator goes to inject the radio tracer, the system displays an updated image every few seconds to allow the operator to confirm that the injection was successful. We'll just continue to watch as the image is acquired. The resulting 3D PET images were reconstructed with a time frame of 33 milliseconds, and the time-lapse video that you see here is replayed 10 times slower. This type of imaging allows you to visualize the first pass of the tracer as it travels through the animal. The speed of this real-time imaging is unique within the marketplace, with dynamic images being reconstructed with timeframes as low as 25 milliseconds. As mentioned on the previous slide, this can be used to confirm success, sorry, to confirm successful injection of the radio tracer, first pass imaging, as well as other possibilities. The development of real-time imaging was also crucial to the development of sensorless cardiac gating that we discussed earlier. Real-time imaging has also allowed for the development of awake or conscious imaging in the brain. This is an area for exploration, as in the past, this was not possible. So the possibilities and studies here are limitless. The animals are prepared with small fiducial markers placed behind their ears and on either side of the nose. These are small, less than one millimeter in diameter, and are saturated in a radio tracer and glued in place. The animals are acclimatized to the red plastic tube in their home cage. This helps to reduce stress that they may experience during the image acquisition, which may affect the resulting images. The images can be acquired or reconstructed as static or dynamic images, depending on the study's need. In this video, we can see an animal being positioned into the tube. The size of the tube is selected to prevent the animal from being able to turn within the tube, but not to cause constriction of the animal, thus reducing the stress experienced by the animal as much as possible. Once positioned, the animal is placed on the bed of the Super Argus system and moved into the machine. Here are the resulting images of an awake rat. The real-time images reconstructed at 50 frames per second are shown here. We can see the fiducial markers circled in green and the resulting signal seen throughout the brain. 
the movement from the fiducial markers and signal is seen as the animal is awake and under no form of sedation. Below the resulting motion corrected images can be seen. These could also be split to provide a dynamic image in 3D over time, if you are interested in the dynamic process. For example, changes in brain activity as a result of a stimuli. Again, this is a newly developed technique which has not been possible in the past. We would love to chat with anyone who has some ideas on studies in which this could be utilized to study any number of neurological disorders. Finally, I would like to spend the remaining time looking at multiplex PET. This capability on the system was developed by a consortium that spanned both US and Spain, including Cetical, universities in Madrid, as well as MIT and Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. This technique moves from the types of annihilation events that we discussed initially, where during the decay of normal PET isotopes, two gamma rays are sent in opposite directions. In some situations, a triple coincidence may happen. With normal isotopes, this may happen due to interdetector scatter or a random triple event during the annihilation. In addition to standard isotopes, there are non-standard isotopes which routinely emit three gamma rays during an annihilation event. Normally, triple coincidences are disregarded in standard PET imaging. When the imaging system is configured to include triple coincidences, then there can be an increase in sensi sensitivity for the standard isotopes as more annihilation events may be collected by the electronics. However, when triple coincidences are allowed, this opens up PET imaging to some non-standard isotopes, such as iodine-124, bromine-76, technesium-94, and many others. If we now inject an animal with two different tracers, one standard isotope and one non-standard isotope, multiplex PET can be achieved in a single acquisition. This option includes the software to separate out these individual signals. In doing multiplex PET, imaging multiple disease processes can be interrogated simultaneously within the same animal. Let's consider the use of PET in oncology again. FDG could be used as a traditional PET radioisotope to look at metabolism, while a non-traditional PET tracer could be used to look at hypoxia, blood flow, or other receptors of interest. Combining this information becomes increasingly important in tumor staging, therapeutic response, drug delivery, drug resistance, or even mechanisms that trigger metastases. Of course, having an anatomical image to provide context to the PET signal is always a benefit. The multiplex software is then able to separate the two different tracers from the acquired data, again, providing information on multiple biological or molecular processes simultaneously. The possibilities with multiplex PET are endless and open to extensive research and development. In this example, FDG was injected to look at cerebral metabolic activity, while an iodine-124 CT tracer was injected to study dopamine, dopamine transporters. The combined multiplex PET image is co-registered with a CT image. The software is then able to deconvolve the two images into the separate signals. This is FDG image to look at the cerebral metabolism and the CIT image to look at dop dopamine transporters. Thank you for joining me today to discuss the Super Argus systems. As a reminder, we started by reviewing the basic principles of preclinical PET imaging, reviewed the available systems from CETACOL, discussed some of the key applications for imaging, and then focused our remaining time on what makes the CETACOL systems unique. I hope you enjoyed the presentation today and walk away having learned something about the technology or systems as it may relate to the research that you're doing. I'll now pass things back to Liam to start our Q&A session. All right, thanks so much for the presentation, Tanya. And yes, we'll now move on to the Q&A session. And as a reminder, if you do have a question for Tanya, please submit it using the Ask a Question box to the left of the media player. Uh, so let's dive right in. The first question today is, uh, and you might have mentioned this already, but are there any special room requirements for installing the Super Argus PET CT system? Liam, it's a great question. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the system itself does meet the regulations set out by the FDA. Um, however, these are for the CT system component itself. And what people need to keep in mind is when we're doing PET imaging, we're using radioactive tracers. And so there are specific uh, things to consider when setting up the room for this. 
Uh, so there will need to be a place where the tracers themselves can be handled as well as the animals. Once they're injected, they will be radioactive for some time, depending on the tracers that are injected. So a space will be required to prepare, calibrate, and inject the radio tracers. As well, you'll need monitoring equipment to make sure that that area um, is clean and that all the radioactivity um, is cleaned up once the imaging session is complete. And then you may want to take into account a place for the animals to be held while um, the radioisotopes continue to decay um, after the imaging session is complete. But again, all of this is um, considerations um, across all pet systems and not the system specifically. One other thing to keep in mind, if you're placing the system because there is uh, no extra shielding required um, in a room with other equipment, you do need to have a minimum distance between it and other equipment. Um, this is on the order of one meter. Um, if there are other pet systems in the room or other radio tracers in the room, you do want to set up um, some type of shielding to prevent any stray radiation coming from those sources from entering um, the Super Argus system. So just things to think about when you're configuring uh, your room layout. All right, excellent answer. Um, next one here, what radioisotopes uh, can be used with the Setacal system? For sure, like all, mo all PET systems, um, your standard radioisotopes can be used. So things like fluorine-18, carbon-11, and oxygen-15. But what's most important is to consider the half-life of these agents uh, when you're considering the logistics of your study. If they have a very short half-life, like oxygen-15, for example, where the half-life is two minutes, then you would have to be very close to the source of that radio tracer, for example, the cyclotron. Um, however, if you're using something like FDG, which has fluorine-18, the half-life is 110 minutes, and so the logistics of getting the agent from the source, i.e. the cyclotron, to where you're doing your studies and the amount of time that that takes um, is much longer, and so the logistics of setting up those samples, um, sorry, those studies becomes much simpler. Um, with the addition of multiplex PET that I talked about during the presentation, we've opened up um, the utility of isotopes which cause triple coincidences, so where three gamma rays are sent out. Um, and these isotopes include iodine-124, bromine-76, technesium-94, or copper-60. Um, the list that I've provided here are not exhaustive, and there's many other isotopes which can be used with the system. So if there's different isotopes that you want to use as you're setting up some unique tracers within your lab, please just reach out, um, and we'll be able to confirm that those agents are um, possible to use with the Super Argus system. Okay, perfect. Um, and actually, here's another question about radio tracers. Uh, do any of these or the scan itself have a deleterious effect on animal models? Uh, for example, could you use the technology several times on the same rat to uh, do something like track progression of tumor growth? Uh, this is a really great question, um, and the answer is the radio tracers themselves do not have a deleterious effect. They do emit radiation, but we inject at such a low dose that there's no long-term effect um, on the animal model. When we co-register with a CT image, for example, um, you do obviously expose the animal to some dose of radiation. With the Super Argus system, this has been optimized so that that amount of radiation is minimal. Um, which would allow us to get a very nice anatomical image in approximately 15 seconds, I think I was mentioning throughout the presentation. Um, but that dose is low enough that you could use that animal over the course of a longitudinal study and do several imaging sessions um, throughout that, that study. Excellent. All right. Great answer. Um, another question here. Is the only option for multi-animal handling that four-mouse configuration that you showed in the slides? Uh, so no, the configuration that I showed in the slides is the commercially available option um, that Setacal has put forward. However, they've often worked with um, researchers directly to figure out a configuration that works to meet their needs based on their animal models and the studies. Uh, so for example, the animal model that you saw was a two by two um, grid of animals. They have made systems where the animals may be three laying across. What's most important is to figure out the diameter of the bore of the system that you're going to work with um, such that they can design a bed system which would meet the needs um, of your specific research study. And again, that's all something that um, can be worked out as we, we move forward with our research discussions with you. Excellent. And I think in the interest of time, uh, we'll make this next 
question, the last one. Um, but you talked a bit about cardiac gating, uh, like ECG-based gating or automatic gating. What are these used for, and uh, how does that work? No, it's a fantastic question. So on the Super Argus system, you have the ability to do cardiac imaging. And with that, you do want to be able to understand where you are within the cardiac cycle. Um, traditionally, that's been done with ECG leads and triggered based on the ECG signal that um, is input into the system. Uh, that's, the system does have that capability, and that's no problem to be able to acquire images in that way. Additionally, they've developed a way which um, is sensorless um, cardiac imaging in which there's no need for the ECG leads to be attached to the animal or input into the system. Um, and the, the system is able then to reconstruct the cardiac cycle simply from the images. Um, and the really great part of this is that it can be used on the multi-animal handling system. So you could do four mice in the 160 bore system simultaneously with cardiac imaging using no sensors. Um, where this can be used is to look at myocardial perfusion, um, metabolism within the myocardium, looking at the infarct size, um, and that would all be based on uh, specific radio tracers designed for those studies. Um, additionally, radio tracers may be designed to look at specific inflammatory responses within the heart um, as a result of certain disease or plaque formation in coronary artery disease. All right, perfect. And I think with that, we'll close things out. But uh, thanks so much, Tanya, for all the really fantastic information, both in your presentation as well as the Q&A session. Excellent. Thanks so much, Liam. I did notice in the Ask a Question box that there's numerous people asking for pricing and different information along those lines. It is crucial that we have a conversation about your specific research applications, both talking about the animal models as well as your specific goals with those studies to better understand which bore size would be needed as well as how many rings would be required. Um, and so the, the pricing on those systems varies dramatically. So um, feel free to reach out to me um, on the slide there. You can see both my email and phone number and we'd be more than happy to help um, facilitate those discussions and get some inf more information off to you. And I look forward to speaking to anyone who would require or want additional information.